What's up, guys? Welcome to episode eight of the PJF podcast. Got a great conversation today all about jump mechanics. So you guys always ask me, what's the fastest way to improve vertical jump? This is it, jump mechanics. So I went through standing vertical jump, a two-foot approach jump, and a one-foot approach jump, and I broke down the two most common errors in mechanics uh, for each of those categories. Um, don't want to miss this. You definitely want to tune in, listen to it all. We get into some deep science, but we always try to bring it back to the practical of like, hey, this is what matters. This is what affects your weekend. Uh, so, so don't get discouraged if some of the words go over your head. Um, so tune in, enjoy it. Let us know your questions and comments. Uh, we're, we're reading everything on YouTube, on Instagram, and be sure to uh, leave us a good review uh, or a bad review if you don't like it uh, on iTunes so that we can get your feedback and continue to provide good quality stuff. Let's go. You're listening to the PJF Podcast, a show dedicated to decoding elite sports performance and fitness. I'm Paul Favorites, and I'm an MBA strength and conditioning and performance trainer. If you want to become superhuman, take your fitness and take your sports performance to the next level, this is the podcast for you. Let's do it. All right, let's get into the topic for the day. So today we're talking about jump mechanics. Oh, So we get so many coaches, mostly players, ask us, hey man, what's the quickest way? What's the fastest way to improve vertical? My real answer is don't worry about the Patience. the, yeah, the yeah. duration, like just do what's right and see where it takes you. Mm -hmm. But the answer to the fastest way uh, to make vertical jump improvements is changing your mechanics. A lot of people have the power necessary to dunk or to truly reach their genetic p potential, but they don't have the positions. Mm -hmm. So you get a lot of people who they have the raw power to be able to dunk, but they just don't know how to actually utilize it. They don't understand their mechanics. So you get a lot of these guys who jump the same or a couple inches higher from a standstill and from a running. So if you can't jump at least four inches more from your approach, when we look at like a 15 foot approach, you're struggling with your mechanics. Yeah. It might be something else, but it's, the chances are very, very good that it's just your mechanics. Four, four inches is the barometer you like to use? Yeah. That so like if you approach. add a 20 mm -hmm. straight up and then I give you 15 feet, like the combine standards, and you got a 23, you got some issues. If you have like a 25, okay, that's respectable. That's pretty, pretty normal. The great ones are the ones with the biggest difference. So like um, Chris Staples, oh, or, yeah. um, I don't remember what his standing was, but he had the biggest difference I've ever witnessed. I think it was 12 or 13 inches. And this is from a 15-foot approach. Yeah. Remember, this isn't from a max approach. From, from even further distance, your separation is going to be even higher. From a 15-foot approach, um, there's some guys That's that'll creep hardly. up. It'll be like 10. Yeah. They'll, they'll be 10 inches higher. Uh, but he was like, I think he was over 12 inches. That's gnarly. Yeah, wow. insane. I think a 45, uh, 45 or 46-inch approach vert. Yeah. Stupid. Um, so the, and, and that's a testament. That's all you need to know right there in terms of how important mechanics can be. Right, Just right. Yeah. And we so we've done some good studies with him in the lab. Uh, we got a lot of good motion tracking force plate data. I might actually drop some of that stuff because we've actually learned a lot from him. He's mm -hmm. a beast, man. Um, but yeah, so you know, test yourself, find out where you're at because most people do have some sort of mechanical issue. Um, there's some guys where it's like. I think Harrison Barnes, where he was like a 38 <laughs> yeah. standing, yeah, yeah. 38 running. <laughs> that should not be a thing. Yeah. Nick Young. Did you know Nick Young has either the highest or the second highest vertical of all time? Yeah. Nick mm -hmm. Young. I mean, he was... Nick Young. Yeah, yeah but you like, don't think of him as like a slasher no. dunker. Yeah. He's got those old USC highlights, though, where he's... Yeah, yeah like yeah. he was athletic. Yeah. But <laughs> but you think of him as like a shooter. Oh, yeah. Or most people listeners think of him as yeah. the guy who shot it and turned around too early and celebrated. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Wrongly. Yeah, that, that was... He blames a, Gilbert Arenas for that, ironically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, I, I heard he that. He was Gilbert Arenas' rookie. So. <laughs> <laughs> he yeah, he said he the, messed up his whole life. Yeah. He, he said, said Gilbert messed up my life. Yeah. Gilbert said he caught him two years too late before he got... He said, if you would have caught me before when I was earning that contract, he's just like... you would have been one of the oh, best players yeah, yeah. of all time he's just like unfortunately you caught me after i got all the money so <laughs> wow <laughs> you know no, who but I, who, what were you gonna say who has the highest vertical of all time combine standing uh just all time running period pat Connaughton. no no 
No. Did Maybe he's standing. He not running. He's up there. Um, DJ Stevens. Oh yeah. Forty six point five. I want to say. Um, I think Pat Connaughton was a forty four or a forty four point five. Some would argue that he packed his shoulder um, <laughs> to that's, take three inches off the standing that's reach. That's a bet move. That's what some would argue. That's a bet move. <laughs> but he does have bounce. Pat is he's an, he's an all around athlete. Yeah, DJ Stevens. Yeah, forty six inches. It so wasn't forty six five, just flat forty six. Forty six. Then there's like yeah. Kenny Gregory, who was like forty five. Um, Diallo or yeah. Hamadou or whatever is like a forty four five. Yeah, forty four five. Yeah, there's a lot of there's there's a lot of guys in that range. Um, yeah, I mean there's and then you always have your miss of like yeah, well Wilt jumped like sixty inches, <laughs> dude. No, he didn't. That that's the biggest myth that kills me. Okay, Wilt was an athlete. All right, he was. But I did the calculations one day. What do they say he has? Some people said he has like a forty six inch vertical. Well. Yeah. yeah. And I did the calculations, him at 7-1. I forgot what it was, but his head would be like 15 inches over the rim. Yeah. And I'm sitting there. I spent hours one day searching for photos. I never found one photo where his head was even at the rim or above. Yeah. You know who's telling those stories? Who? The old heads. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Man. And then the, the Jordan 48. Mm-hmm. That's somewhat more, believable. Way more believable. I'm fine with that yeah. rumor. Mm-hmm. But it is a rumor. Like nobody knows. Yeah. There we didn't have official combine testing. Right. And and so he was probably tested with a full approach. So he probably ran from the three point line. Which if you get guys a full approach, things change. Uh Zach Levine, combine, forty one. Lakers workout when you get a full oh, approach, right, right, forty six. Right. Yeah. So you had a five inch difference from your fifteen foot approach and your mm-hmm. and your max, especially if you're a one foot jumper, because one foot jumpers do much better with more momentum. Yeah. So there's some guys where you see them in the combine get a forty five. If they had that full approach, they might be a forty nine. Yeah. What do you know? think the practicality of limiting it to fifteen feet is? I don't like. I I would rather see a standing, a fifteen, and a full approach. Yeah. Just but if I was picking two, was. because I understand they don't have a ton of time. If I was picking two, it would be a standstill and a full approach. Mm. Because I want to know what you do with momentum. Yeah. That's a huge thing as an athlete. And we're already getting your raw power from the standing vertical. So what are we really getting from that 15 foot? Exactly. It's kind of... Like if you're a a guard approaching, you're probably approaching from the three-point line, Mm -hmm. right? If we're driving, we're setting up at the three-point line. So we have a max approach. If you're a big, you're probably approaching from straight up or from a one-step, two-step, right? Like... 15 foot approach is the least practical yeah do i i now i use it because it's so standardized exactly that's why we have yeah. hundreds of of you nba have, players yeah. that have been through it yeah exactly you have to use it just for data analysis yeah because yeah. if i'm sitting there breaking down i want to show you your comparables mm-hmm. of like your athleticism is similar to this person mm-hmm. um and we just don't have enough data on the full approach but yeah if, if i'm the combine i don't know why i wouldn't switch it plus it makes the ratings look better because your verticals go up exactly. now you're gonna yes. start flirting with 50 inches every now and then that's good yeah, that's a good, good. Yeah. those things always go viral <laughs> exactly you think about that too ter- coming down in transition you know what i mean when lebron gets a full head of steam from half court or even Giannis, where you had that highlight where he was you know a few inches away from the free throw line this year yeah full head of steam well and that's and the other thing no, you're never going to get that level of adrenaline oh, in yeah. the combine yeah. so you're automatically going to get two three inches mm-hmm. from the adrenaline in a game so yeah um anyways uh, i don't know how we got off on that but um back to mechanics back to mechanics so let me break it down by, let's do this. We'll go standing vertical jump. I'm going to give you the couple that mm-hmm. I think um, go wrong the most. Um, and then I'm going to give you approach off two, and then I'll give you the approach off one. Now, in the vert code, uh, in the vert code elite, we have the mechanic section. We dive pretty deep into all of these different things. I'm just going to give you the two, two or three for each one uh, that I see the most often. And we do these camps. 500 like players the errors that you see the people errors yeah, the yeah, errors and and, and we're, we're lucky to have seen mm-hmm. hundreds <laughs> and hundreds and hundreds yeah. of players and like we go through these camps and we assess 500 kids exactly. at a time yeah, right say, Five, 500, 500 elite yeah. kid uh, youth basketball players at a time and we do these camps every year and so we do a lot of recording um, we have data on all of this stuff so we can really break it down and say confidently what kids are missing yeah right if you're just a trainer and you just train people one-on-one or even one on ten 
your database isn't big enough. Uh, but we have this, and then we have obviously the thousands on um, the online programs. We mm. get the feedback from them too. So uh, we might have the most data on approach jump than anybody ever in history. That's fair. <laughs> um, and so these are the things that I see going wrong for a standing vertical jump torso angle. Interesting. So part of it comes from the myth that we always got to keep our chest up, mm -hmm. right? We're just always taught that, right? We're, we're taught in squats, keep your chest up. Unfortunately, sometimes in deadlifts, people say, keep your <laughs> chest up. We don't want to do that on our deadlifts. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, sometimes the instinct gets coached out of the athlete where they would naturally go one way, but they remember a coach saying, hey, you got to keep your chest up. And so they start doing that and it makes you much more knee dominant, much more quad dominant. Mm. Now there is a certain subset of the population who is going to do better with that. They're usually the athletes who are also your great front squatters. Mm -hmm. So they'll get in the rack and kill a front squat, but they're not strong deadlifters, right? They're not strong through the hips. Yeah. They're just powerful through the quads. It's not necessarily where we want to be, uh, especially from an injury prevention standpoint, mm -hmm. but so that you, you got to keep in mind, there are some that jump with an upright torso. And then at the other end of the spectrum, there are hip hingers um, where you're basically bringing your torso almost completely parallel with the floor. So now don't think of a front squat, think of an RDL, Yeah, that's it. right? You start with that minimal knee bend and it's all hip flexion. And then at the bottom, you start to bend your knees. Mm -hmm. If you took a snapshot of both guys going up, you got the, the hip dominant and the knee dominant jumper. They look very different going down, but when they transition to go up, if you took a snapshot, they look very similar. So they organize eventually into mm -hmm. the same position. It's almost like if you looked at KD's shot and you looked at Steph's shot, they bring it up on a different path, but they end up yeah. at the same release point or, yes. or you know, uh, the angle of their hand is very similar at release. Mm -hmm. And what matters most is that point of release, Exactly. right? We, we don't really, I mean, what happens below the chest Sure, it matters, but you can get to that same point by very different strategies. Mm -hmm. And so that's one reason why we're not going to coach the instinct out of athletes on a standing vertical jump, because a lot of times you're going to self-organize and you're just going to do it the right way. I just think it's the opposite of when people listen to coaches and they should be more of a hip dominant and they go, oh, well, that's, that's a bad way to jump. I got to yeah. keep my chest up. Mm -hmm. Coach is the instinct. So I think with standing vertical jump, when it comes to torso angle, coaches do more harm than they do good. That's interesting. So for us, I'm going to kind of let them go on the torso angle, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to play with it. So we got to figure out how you jump the best. Yeah, you got to find because your intuitive Because sometimes way. you might be jumping with an upright torso, and I go, hey, try it like this, and you do it, and all of a sudden you get higher. Well, great. We, yeah. we just fix it. <laughs> now let's run with that. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to spend uh, too much time hammering in a certain torso angle. Mm -hmm. I'm going to let you figure it out. Now... Here's another issue that coaches make, like with the higher level coaches who, has, who have access to um, technology. So they'll put them on a force plate, right? Yeah. And I made this mistake the, the very first year that I started messing <laughs> with force plates. Put them on a force plate. You have them drop. The hip dominant jumper who likes to really hip hinge and bring their torso down, their eccentric force oh, is yeah. super light. It looks like they produce nothing mm -hmm. on the way down. And as a trainer, you go, oh my gosh, they relax so well, Yeah. right? Whereas the guy who keeps his chest up and drops, they have a that higher, they're, they're putting more pressure on the plate. They have a mm. higher eccentric force. Um, and so typically, like if you relax really well on the way down, that's a good thing. But it's not actually their ability to relax. It's the fact that they're throwing their torso yeah. down and your torso is heavy. Exactly. So think so about like, how would you become lighter on mm -hmm. a scale? Like you would lean kind forward. of lean forward, yeah. lift up with your feet a little bit. That's what you're doing when you're going hip dominant yeah, torso first. Sense. Just weight distribution. Yeah, it's yeah. weight distribution. So it looks like they produce nothing on the eccentric and they relax super well mm -hmm. and coaches freak out. They're like, this is the best athlete. No, <laughs> you're just being tricked because that's just their yeah. strategy. And then if you and correlate that, that hip hinge with the relaxation phase, you're just... It, well, well, the problem is people people put too much weight on it because... Yeah. Now they go, oh, well, he relaxes well, so we don't got to focus on that. Well, no, you do. It's just that's how he jumps. So sometimes you can finesse a test just by changing your mechanics, yeah. right? Or some people it's like, well, he does good with the hip hinge, so that means his he's really strong in the post chain, but his anterior chain is not strong, so we got to get his quad stronger. Again, this is a test. You can finesse it. So don't all of a sudden correlate muscle strength yeah. with how they're jumping. All right, anyways, so 
just know that you could jump high from a complete hip hinge. Mm -hmm. You could jump high from a more of a vertical torso. Or what most people will do is a little bit of both. So they get closer to like a 45 degree torso angle. So their torso is not parallel to the floor. It's not an RDL. Mm -hmm. And they're not a front squat where their chest is up. They're somewhere in the middle. Think of like a maybe a trap bar deadlift. Exactly. Um, that's where most people will do their best. But like play around with it, figure it out. Now, we have to work on all styles in some way. So especially if you're a hip hinge, you have to figure out how to also train uh, that upright because in a game, yeah. there's a lot of times where you only have you only have time to get up from the position you're in. Yeah, and so there's a lot of times where you're under the hoop. Mm -hmm. Think about I'm pushing somebody out with my forearm. Ball goes up. I got to get up as is. Exactly. I don't have the time to then hip hinge and load up. Mm -hmm. um, and then also like with approach jumps, a vertical torso is typically better. We don't want a huge torso collapse on our approach jumps. So either way. If you are that hip hinge dominant, dominant jumper, we also have to go the other way. We got to work on both. So continue to strengthen your superpower, mm -hmm. but also set up some drills where, um, you know, timing is a factor where you can't load up and you can't get to your perfect strategy. Sometimes it's just like, Hey, relax, stand up straight. And then just throw a tennis ball up yeah, and then just that. make them react and get up. And you know, the little things with time constraints, um, things like, Death jumps are great. You can't mm -hmm. go into a huge torso collapse and still get off the ground quick. Yeah, so there's a lot of different ways to do it, but just know because a lot of a lot of trainers think like, oh, if that's how they jump, I'm just going to go all in on mm -hmm. that. But just know they're going to see different torso angles in games. Yeah, exactly. So the other side of it, let's say you are good with your chest up. I still want you to be a good um, hip hinge jumper for one reason, and that's for boxing out. Because when you're boxing out, you got to push your butt back into somebody. And when mm -hmm. you push your butt back, you're now in that torso angle. So now we're in that hip hinge and then ball goes up off the rim. I got to get up from that position. Yeah. So you have to put yourself in a situation where you got to master both. I like from that. from yeah. the strength side, you're going to, I mean, balancing your squats, balancing your deadlifts, that's probably going to take care of it. On the plyo side, um, just putting yourself in different situations. Like you could do a, a non counter movement box mm -hmm. jump where you're sitting on the box. And then instead of torso completely upright, start in a little bit of a hip hinge. So I'm starting more of that coiled up and then I get up from there, or I'm just doing box jumps and I'm starting from my box out position. Mm -hmm. Um, there's just, there's a lot of different ways that you can go about doing it. Like a kettlebell swing is going to be good yeah. for that hip dominant position to build that power. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's a lot of different things that you got to keep in mind there. But, um, the next one is drop speed. So the eccentric. Mm -hmm. So this, there's a lot of myths around this and this gets super complex. So <laughs> yeah. um, I remember a couple of years ago when you were making the breakthrough with the eccentric dropping where you're yeah. like, I, I saw where you're balancing out what the, what the, you know, and the history was telling you and then what you were discovering on your own. Yeah. So go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So I had a little bit of a breakthrough, but um, context is everything for this one. So, speed. So a lot of us say when you drop, the faster you drop into the eccentric, the faster we get up, the higher we get up. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and the idea is that, um, the muscle spindle. So like what's causing that stretch reflex, um, it is, it, it's responsive to load, but it's responsive to speed. And so if we go fast down, it's theoretically a harder stretch reflex. Mm -hmm. Now, stretch reflex and stretch shortening cycle are not actually the same thing. Stretch reflex is a component of the stretch shortening cycle. Exactly. And it does still probably have some influence. But anyways, when we go down fast, we should, um, we should trigger that, that, my, that myotatic reflex. But uh, what we found is that is true in highly trained athletes who have really good strength. Mm. So for those athletes, typically when you drop fast, you're going to get up a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. And that's what most coaches, like you go to like a combine training facility where they're trying to get every inch out of the vertical, the cue that they're always going to use, drop fast, attack the floor. And I like that. Now, why I say context is key is because I always went with that thought process. And then, um, Nafal at, uh, Cal State Fullerton, mm -hmm. we started cool. messing around. We started doing some different studies. I don't think they published this one. But he was doing untrained. He took a bunch of untrained athletes, and I think he was cueing the speed of the drop. Mm -hmm. So some of them dropped fast, and some of them just relaxed and just did their you know normal let gravity take you down. Um, there was no correlation. So speed 
dropping did not improve the vertical jump. Mm -hmm. And so I did some more digging and I found out more, uh, there's a lot of studies with beginner athletes, the faster they went down, the lower they jumped. So that actually yeah. decreased their vertical. So it kind of goes to show you the lower level athletes actually jump higher with less speed on the way down because yeah. they don't have the strength to get out of it. Yeah, they got to recruit all the strength on the way up. Yeah so, yeah, so if I'm taking more speed down, I better have that strength to be able to pop out of that exactly. hole. Um, and so you got to figure out what type of athlete you're working with because if your cue is always drop fast, mm -hmm. you might actually be decreasing their vertical. Yeah. Now we want to get you to that point where that does work for you because, I mean, obviously we got to build strength. We got to build some mm -hmm. general stuff. Uh, but like in the vert code, we add speed drops. And so for the, especially if you're a lower level athlete, like you got to be doing these, it's basically start up high. And then we're thinking about attacking the floor. So I'm pulling myself down with my hip flexors, with my hamstrings, I'm pulling myself to the floor. I'm not letting gravity take me down. And then I reverse out of it as fast as possible. And then I just stop myself. So I don't necessarily have to jump as high as I can. I'm strictly working on transitioning out of the bottom. Mm -hmm. And, um, so we want to start to build that in because we got to work you towards that point to where we have that, that stretch reflex really trained. Um, but in the meantime, let's remember that if we're trying to get inches out of that athlete who's not trained, let's not cue fast on the way down. Yeah. Let's let you self-organize. And the, the thing is a lot of, a lot of people figure it out themselves. They'll kind of just relax on the way down. They'll let gravity pull them down. And then, so for our higher level athletes, typically we're going to cue speed on the way down, but then there's some athletes where I'm going to mess with it and I'm going to say, okay, go fast, see what they get. Mm -hmm. All right, do what's natural, see what they get. All right, go a little bit slower, like relax as much as you can. Let gravity take you down, see what they get. Sometimes even the higher level athletes, when they don't have that cue of speed, they actually get an inch higher. Mm -hmm. So everybody's going to be a little bit different here. Um, so the best piece of advice is figure out which one you are. Exactly. Um, and either way, we need to be doing those drills for faster transitions mm -hmm. because that's what we want to work towards. But if you're going to get tested, we want what's best for right now. Exactly. And what's best for right now might not be the same between me and you. I might be doing better with speed. You might be doing better with just normal gravity taking you down. Exactly. So know who you are, know your goal. Yes. Um, and then the other thing with, with the, the drop speed, the better we get with our strength training, with our eccentric rate mm -hmm. of force development, the more we're going to be going up in this area. Um, and so the plyos that we do is huge. Um, the, the faster eccentric stuff, like mm -hmm. the drop catches that we do, um, we do these bounce rep squats where you're kind of getting up and then relaxing and catching yourself at the bottom, that kind of stuff where you're building up that eccentric rate of force development. I don't think, again, I keep going back to this. I don't think that your long, slow, heavy eccentric yeah, is going to do that much as far as like getting you out of the hole faster. Yeah. Now it's good for some general strength. Mm -hmm. Again, that, that long, slow eccentric, that's not eccentric overload. Eccentric overload is lowering a weight that you wouldn't be able to lift concentrically exactly. because you're whatever percentage stronger eccentrically. So a, a true eccentric overload would be something where it's like a one leg squat on the way down mm -hmm. and there's no way I can get back up on that one leg. Yeah, so I have to stand with two. Yes. Or like the old school, I don't really use this because it's a little more dangerous, but like I'm lowering with the barbell. I got two friends on the side and they help raise it mm -hmm. up. Um, <laughs> Which has a little too dangerous, yeah. but it's the old uh, school approach. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, lowering slowly on the way down, if you could still lift it, that's not eccentric overload. That's mm -hmm. just overloading the time under tension on the eccentric, which is valuable. I mean, if it's about hypertrophy, it's about time under tension. That's yeah. all that matters. I mean, there's a few other factors, but at the end of the day, time under tension. So you're getting more time under tension on that. So yeah, I mean, I'm fine in our first couple of phases doing some eccentric work, but don't think that it's like some sort of magical eccentric overload. Yeah. It's definitely not. So that's not going to lead to huge results that's on that speed. That's valuable information right there because I know there's a lot of just casual, even trainers that sit there and don't necessarily know the difference between that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that's a that's a huge uh, misconception. And again, I'm not saying that it's bad. I'm saying no, exactly. There's a purpose for it, but yeah, just, yeah, know what you're know and, what you're and doing. Just and know in towards. this podcast, like a lot, you got to understand context. <laughs> yeah. So, like the last video that I put out, um, I don't know if you saw, I put the the post on Instagram about running on flat ground. Oh yeah, and I'm talking about <laughs> for this phase, for this quality mm -hmm. that we're trying to build with top end speed, we don't want hill sprints, we don't want mm -hmm. resisted sprints. And then trainers came in on the comments and started describing the benefits of hill sprints yeah 
I'm like, I know that hill sprints are beneficial. I'm saying it's not a substitution and it's not a good way to build that top end speed like regular flat sprinting would. Yeah. It builds speed in other ways. Mm. And so we want that in other phases. And that's why when you hear this stuff, you got to take it all in and understand that different things uh, lead to different results. Exactly. So it's not necessarily, I'm not saying eccentric, slow eccentrics are bad. Mm-hmm. I'm saying it's not going to improve this but it could improve yeah. hypertrophy. That's ironic. I actually had a, a client reach out to me who was on the online program right now, and he got to that portion of the uh, the phase where he was just like, he, he reached out to me because he's like, because the reps and the, the sets were the same for the first time. So he's like, coach, I got six uh, reps of top end sprints, but it's telling me to work up the first three, do it like 75% of, uh, of my max get off. Am I doing 18 total sprints or am I doing six Ooh, total no. sprints? And yeah, yeah. Exactly, but he, and he was kind of confused just because of the reps. I'm like, in this case, your reps and your sets are the same. I was like, and, and how long is your rest period? And he's like, it's two and a half minutes, but I don't even feel tired. And I'm like, exactly. And yeah. I'm like, you know, and I use the, the computer analogy. I'm like, consider yourself as a computer and everything that you do in the program is a, is a certain set of code. You know what I mean? That has an overall purpose, which mm-hmm. is toward, geared towards your goal. Yeah. But you can't look at everything isolated and, yeah. and understand that the programming may be above your current understanding. Yeah. Which is That's context. the thing. That's the quote right there. <laughs> The, the programming might be above your current understanding because we get yeah. so many people that are really trying to understand and I mm-hmm. like that. That's cool. Yes. But just know that you're not going to fully, <laughs> yeah, you're exactly. not, and I'm going to do my best to describe yeah. everything, but you're not going to fully understand everything. Yeah. And as an athlete, it's, it's arguably, if you're the athlete, that's, that's kind of a better place to be in anyway, is you want to take as much away from a conscious aspect and be as subconscious as possible with what you're yeah. trying to do. Anyways, let's move on to approach. Approach keys. So approach jump off two. The number one issue is penultimate. Mm. Probably the most important um, aspect of the double leg jump. Um, and, and I'll give you two little subcategories here. So for the penultimate, length and lift. Those are the two that we see over and over and over again going wrong. Length means you're not getting long enough. Mm-hmm. So your, your penultimate, second to last step. So if I'm stepping in right, left, jump, when I'm pushing from left to right, that's second to last stride, that is my penultimate. And I wanna make that a long stride. Mm-hmm. So my, my, my third to last step is more of a short stride. My second to last step should be elongated. And it does a lot of things. It sets the trajectory for the takeoff. Um, it sets our, our hips up in a good low position. So with that long penultimate, yeah. we're stepping in at a lower position. Um, and so it's so essential that you have length. So I had one guy tell me, uh, I, man, we should have a compilation of just all the stuff that trainers have said to me that, that I disagree <laughs> with. Um, no. So, so one trainer told me penultimate length doesn't matter. And he said, it doesn't matter because if length mattered, then you could just bound into it. So he's saying like, well, if that was true, then yeah. you would jump into the penultimate. But it's, that's like me saying, yeah, hill sprints are bad because if you run up a cliff, you fall off. <laughs> like, if yeah. you take anything to the complete extreme, yeah, it's no longer going to be good. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean that length is bad, right? And, and this is just, you, you see the evidence everywhere. Yeah. Every good, I'll say 99% of great two-foot jumpers have an elongated penultimate. Yeah. Now, the goal is never more length. It's not like, hey, I got to get as long as possible. It's just, I want this to be pretty long. And that doesn't just come from your, your anthropometrics. It doesn't come from mm. your, your leg length. That's another myth because even the small guys have great penultimate steps. Mm. It comes down to how hard you're pushing into that step. So just like with sprint speed, it's not just about length. It's about how much force you apply. So if I'm in sprinting, if I'm getting out of the gate and I apply a lot of force, my stride length increases. It doesn't increase by me reaching further. I applied more force, and so I went further. Mm -hmm. Uh, More more displacement. That's the same thing with the penultimate. If I'm pushing, if I'm stepping into my penultimate, I'm not going anywhere. If I'm pushing, then I'm going to create that distance. I'm going to create that length. Um, So length is a very, very, very big one. And then the and then yeah, and then the other one is lift, and this one is one of the most common. Uh, now some super elastic jumpers do good with a lift, uh, because it's almost like you were running to jump on like a mini trampoline and Mm -hmm. jump off where they actually kind of have this initial jump and then they bounce. It's very rare. If you're listening to this, uh, it's probably not you. (laughs) Um, if you want to see somebody who's actually good with that, go see, have you ever seen Dexton on Instagram? 
Dexton. Like Dexton four or something like that. I don't know. I, he's a little guy. Yeah. Like little guy, oh, but yeah, he just has like yeah. crazy dunk videos. Like super little. He's yeah. Like five, four. So he's a guy that lifts a little bit into his penultimate. Mm-hmm. Um, and he does a lot of different things that defy gravity because he lifts and then he also doesn't use a turn stance. He goes just toes straight forward. Like he breaks all of our rules and he does <laughs> really good. <laughs> so like there, uh, there's always exceptions. Yeah. Um, but still the 99%, they're still going to be, um, the ones that don't lift. So what I mean by lift is like, it, again, if I'm jumping right, left and my penultimate is that left to right push. Um, if I'm going off that left and I lift upwards, mm-hmm. you don't want to lift up to go down. If you're watching somebody's head, their head, as they get into the penultimate should be aiming downwards. Sometimes it'll be straight horizontal, mm-hmm. but most of the time it's actually going to go down or the better thing to track would actually be their hip. If you looked at their hip and you drew a line through their penultimate, that that hip should be either going horizontal or slight downward. Um, the, the uh, But a lot of times you're going to see if you draw a line with that hip, it actually lifts up. And so now if that hip lifts, now we're getting to that ground contact and now we have to lower. We have mm-hmm. to drop all the way back in the eccentric, hit the amortization, go back into the concentric, valuable ground contact yeah. time. So if I have point whatever, 3.4 seconds to produce force, I don't want to spend all of that ground contact time absorbing force, Mm -hmm. right? You would have to spend at least half of that time absorbing. So now you only have 0.1, 0.2 seconds to produce force. I want more time for force production. And so that's why we want that hip to be in position for explosion. So we're stepping in, like on that right left example, when my left foot hits, I should be at my lowest position. There should be no more lowering. Yeah. I step in actually with a little bit of pretension, um, and from there everything is up, because then all of our ground contact goes towards mm-hmm. force production. Now, if you wanted to take that to the crazy, you'd say, "Well, if longer force ground, ground contact time is better, then why don't I just purposely go slow?" <laughs> so, if you increase your ground contact time past a certain point you lose that momentum, the energy that exactly. you built up in the run-up. Just doing so now it's just vertical. you versus the world. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's just pure you versus gravity, mm-hmm. right? And those are the guys that jump the same from the standstill and the same from running. They don't use that energy. Exactly. So you got to find the perfect ground contact time. The shortest ground contact time isn't always the best. Mm-hmm. If I go the shortest, I'm going to build up speed and then I'm just going to tiptoe off the ground. No real force into the ground. I'm just tiptoeing, right? Uh, if I were to spend long ground contact and go max force, then I would run and I would load up super low and it would kill mm-hmm. my, my momentum. Them. But you want to be somewhere in the middle. And there's always going to be a spectrum. You're going to get your speed jumpers mm-hmm. who do really well with like really short ground contact times. They build up big speed and they just get off the ground super quick. They rely on that momentum. And then you're going to have guys who do get to a really deep angle, but they still use that run up and they get up. So there's always going to be, um, there's always going to be that spectrum. Um, but what is going to kill it is going to be that lift. Mm -hmm. So we use one drill in the vert code and I've talked about this before. It's such a simple drill (laughs) that I don't know why everybody doesn't do it. It's so all it is, is a band resisted penultimate step. And so all you do is you hook yourself up to a band. And you say, okay, go into your penultimate. Well, the band does two things. If you have band tension and you try to cover distance or, or you don't try to cover distance and you do what you're used to of stepping in mm-hmm. instead of pushing into the penultimate, band's gonna you pull don't, those hips. well, you don't go anywhere. Yeah. If I'm stepping with band tension, I stay the same. And, and it, it gives you that feedback that you need. Mm. And you go, hey man, I told you to get far. You didn't get far. What happened? And then they self-organize and they go, oh, I got to get to that point. Boom. All of a sudden, they push in uh, to the penultimate step. Um, and then the other thing that the band does is if you have band tension around your hip mm-hmm. and you lift into the penultimate step, have you ever lifted high with a band? You get pulled back. Exactly. That's the best right where you need tool. To be. Yes. <laughs> you, need to be, you need to fall down on your back and realize, hey, mm-hmm. that is not where we want to be. You got to push low, a low center of gravity. Now that band is not going to pull you back. You're beating the band. The band is not beating you. Mm-hmm. Now, does that mean that you can do that and all of a sudden it's fixed? No, this is just the primer. <laughs> exactly. this, is just, this is just a feedback tool for you to learn. 
Um, and then you get out of the band and then, you know, you go work on your dunks or you go work on your mechanics. And now all of a sudden stuff is cleaned up. I've seen this stuff be improved in one session, Mm -hmm. um, just by hooking somebody up to a band, just being like, Hey, get from here to here. So easy. And then like we always talk about it, you skip that conscious stage, which is huge for basketball players. Like the more conscious we make, the more words I use, the more conscious it becomes, (laughs) the more conscious it becomes, the slower they get. <laughs> the more you yeah. think, the slower your Science. feet get. That's the classic quote. Yeah. And it's so true. We've all been in that that situation where mm-hmm. you're overthinking and all of a sudden your performance suffers big time. Uh, whereas when you're just like natural and intuitive yeah. and at the, the a subconscious level, mm-hmm. bro, you perform at a whole nother level. So that's the balance that you're walking when you're teaching mechanics. Mm-hmm. Is well, Again, we don't want to coach the instinct out of you. Um, so my rule is like, I'm going to try to use less than five words. Mm. Like if I'm teaching this to you in person, I'm going to try to just show it and then say, okay, do this. And let's see if you can do it. If you don't, then I'm going to use a couple words. I'm going to go, okay, watch how I do this. Watch where my foot is. Can you mimic that? Right? If they can't do that, okay, now I'll use four words, five words. And, And we'll go more and more. And some people need it broken down to the exact detail to get it. But I know If I use five words, that's going to be conscious. If I use 10 words, that's even more conscious. If I use 15 words, that's even more conscious. And the more conscious it becomes, the longer it takes to build back to the subconscious. Mm -hmm. Um, Of course, given that you're going to go out and do the reps every day. Exactly. The amount of reps just continues. But with something like a band, that doesn't even hit the conscious. Mm -hmm. You literally just made a a change at the subconscious level because you let them feel it instead of hear it. You let them feel what they're doing wrong. Uh, instead of hearing what they're doing wrong. So now they can step in and boom, we get we get a, a big improvement. And that's that's a big thing. Like anytime we're looking for mechanics improvements, we want to do the best job we can of just putting you in situations to feel it yourself because mm-hmm. if we don't have to coach it, we're not going to, you know? And, and you always, when you're going to make a change on your mechanics, you always got to ask yourself, is it worth it right now? Mm -hmm. There's times where we'll get an NBA player and I see something and I'm thinking I could improve his vertical by three inches and I don't make the change. Mm -hmm. And the reason is it's probably not that time of year. Maybe we got them in August and I'm sitting there like I could make the appropriate change by September, but could it become fully in in the subconscious, Mm -hmm. you know, by October? I don't know. Yeah. Especially if we're going, well, what are they doing on the court? Well, he's learning this move and that move. He's adding to his bag. He's not just maintaining. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you get guys who are just like, look, I'm just going to maintain my shot so I can focus on other areas. Shoot. You might have a guy who's really trying to improve a certain skill. That's more learning. Mm-hmm. You might have a guy who's trying to learn his team plays, right? That's more learning. You don't want to keep compounding that. And, and, and you have, at some point you have um, competing stimuli. And I don't want my jump mechanics to be competing with what's happening on the court. Exactly. Yeah. So you got to be very careful. You got to understand their overall schedule of where they're at as a player. Exactly. That's super important as far as just being a trainer and understanding being devoid of your ego. Like that's a perfect example of why as a trainer, it's important to not have an ego with what you're doing because of what you're just saying. Like you sacrificed, you know, even though it would look great for you, what you do personally to add that three inches, yeah. you care more about the athlete in a whole. It's like, okay, I may be offering a competing stimuli where it's going to jack it. It could be that one thing that just throws everything out the gate yep. for what he was trying to improve this entire off season. Yep. So yeah, that's. Yeah. I mean, you don't want to, so I, a big thing in the learning, and I don't want to go too far, but I, I like to rant. So mm. uh, <laughs> you don't, okay, so I'm cool with people learning a lot mm-hmm. at one time, but again, at some point it does become a competing stimuli. So let, a, a big part of improvement is in the reflection process after the session. Remember, the improvement doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily happen while you're there. It's when you go home and you're thinking about all of those reps over and over and over again. It's really sitting in your brain. Uh, so you get some improvements in the session, but a lot of it happens in the reflection process. So if I'm in trying to go all in on improving my jump shot, I'm changing my form or I'm working on this skill or I'm learning my team plays, that reflection process has to be there. So if I give you five different things to learn, your reflection process is now split between five things. Mm-hmm. That's not good. It's not how you master. It's like, okay, if you told me you have to master calculus and I hate math. <laughs> I was gonna say, yeah, if, right. if you the have loss, to master calculus, I, I die. If you <laughs> if you have to master calculus in the next two months, or you're gonna die. You either get to 
just focus on calculus for two hours a day, or for two hours a day, you could do calculus and then an hour of history and then an hour of social studies or whatever else. Well, you could look at it and say, well, you're getting two hours of calculus either way. Mm -hmm. You're getting the same. But because I'm splitting my time, I now have con competing stimuli and I don't have that same time for, or that same time or mental focus for the reflection process on the calculus that I just learned. Yeah. It's that old, uh, that I think it's, I, I think it's Bruce Lee, the whole, the quote, uh, the, the man is more dangerous. The man who practices 10, the same kick 10,000 times is yeah. more dangerous than the man who practices yeah. 10,000 kicks. Love that time. quote. Yeah. Love that quote. Um, so now when I'm building, like, okay, so then you might take that and say, so you don't think school is important? You think they should just master <laughs> yeah. one thing from age five? Well, again, now let's go back to the, what we always talk about, mm -hmm. general into specific. Exactly. So general, when at those younger ages, expand the brain, mm -hmm. tap into new parts. Like I don't use math that much right now, but it ta I do believe it tapped into a certain part of my brain or because I was so bad at it, I had to open up a new part of my <laughs> yeah. brain to figure out how to get good at it. Mm -hmm. Same thing, like you expanded your mind by doing all of these different things, yeah. even though you don't use it now. And then at some point, you got to transition into the specifics. Mm -hmm. Same thing with training. We're working general where I'm fine with working on all of these different things. And then eventually we got to get into the specifics. Definitely. That's no yeah. different. Um, anyways, uh, that, that was a nice little tangent. But um, we were talking about teaching. So yeah, I mean, you got to know your time of year. Now, if you come to me, um, at, you, you come to me in March, yeah, April, exactly. yeah. May, Hey, we got time. And then I'm looking at like, Oh, you're on the same team. You already got those plays master mastered. You're going all in on a couple skills that you already have on the court. Mm -hmm. Great. You got plenty of brain space to, to make this change. Um, so then we'll, we'll make the change and we'll rep it out every day. And a lot of times, even at the NBA level, you'll see uh, positive gains. Um, the only time that it's really a, a, almost always a non-negotiable that I'm going to make the change is if I think it's going to lead to an injury. So if you're jumping mm -hmm. from a position that could lead to an injury, I don't care where you're at in the overall process. I'm the most important yeah. skills trainers. You stop doing, you do less <laughs> yeah. team stuff. You do less. I got to fix this because we need them healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, landing mechanics. That's mm -hmm. something like we'll always clean that up or something that is very separate from the game. Because remember, as hoopers, we do a good job of separating things. So like if you have a bad hip hinge in the weight room and I, basically whatever you got going on, I feel like I can teach you the hip hinge in the weight room because they can separate it. They can go, okay, I'm learning this in yes. here. When I yeah. get on the court, it's not like I'm going into a crossover or I'm pulling up for a jump shot and thinking hip hinge. Mm -hmm. These are separate worlds. So it's not as much of a competing stimuli. Whereas if I'm saying like, hey, the way that you uh, are pulling up on a jump shot, you got to work on your hip hinge. Well, now you put that into their realm. You put that into basketball. And so now every time they pull up for a jump shot, they're going to think hip hinge. And so you now change the brain's focus, which can absolutely change a ton of things. Uh, it can change your mechanics, right? Uh, uh, movement and intent are linked. Mm -hmm. So when we have a different intent in the brain, the movement that follows is not the same. It's not the same motor pathway. So yeah, I mean, like if it's in the weight room and I'm trying to teach, we're pretty safe doing it any time of the year. But when it has to do something like jumping where they're going to be doing it on the court, I can't have them thinking about that. So if we're going to make the change, it's going to be early off season, maybe into mid off season. I like that. Yeah. Um, and then if you're, say you're a youth kid, because I, I, I want to, because I know there's a bunch of kids like, what if I'm not in the NBA? What if, you know what I mean? Because there's no, like that's one problem with club basketball is because there's a blurred line of what is the off season. You know what I mean? Kids care so much about their club basketball experience that they don't know when the right time to build is because they don't know if they're looking towards what's more important, their high school season or their club season. They end up playing year round where they got like three weeks off. Yeah, well, the real secret is nothing actually matters. Exactly. Like, who cares? Exactly. <laughs> yes, just go get better every single just day. Just go get exactly. better. It's that's whatever. What, that's At this what, that's age, like, say. okay, if you're a junior or senior, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, we got to go out and perform. If you're a seventh grader, yeah. you're probably not going to get recruited today unless yeah. you are at the top. And if you're at the top, you're yeah. going to get recruited later anyway. Exactly. Just worry so about getting better. Who cares? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but like that club season, man, just just go get better. Mm -hmm. That That is your off season. And if that is not your off season and you have so much competing demands on the court, you got to question if that club team has the right intentions. Mm -hmm. Because you, 
you need enough time to train. That's the number one priority. Exactly. Like I love that clubs get guys to play. That's great. Uh, but if you have so many practices per week and so many tournaments and you can't train, you got to step back and be like, well, maybe this isn't the best option yeah. for me. Maybe you go to that club director and you say, Hey man, we're in, but we're only halfway. Yeah. Like we'll, we'll do the tournaments, but we're not trying to win any trophies. Mm-hmm. We're not trying to be the MVP of this tournament. We're just trying to get better right now. Exactly. So yeah. Um, anyway, so that's for length and lift. Um, turn stance versus straight stance. So this is number two. Mm. Uh, turn stance is what we always talk about. So that is basically if I'm planting right left to take off, uh, my my chest would be facing the right side of the basket. Mm-hmm. So be aimed towards like the the cor- the right uh, side of the the backboard, right? Whereas your square stance is your toes pointed straight forward towards the rim and your chest pointed st- straight forward towards the rim. Uh, we don't have enough deceleration capabilities yeah. in that stance. So run through this in your mind. If I was going to, if I'm going to take you 40 yard dash, right? Any distance, whatever. We'll say 40 yard dash. Take off, go as fast as you can. All right. Are you doing it in your mind? Fast as you can. Now I'm going to randomly tell you, stop. What'd you do? You didn't do it with your toes forward. You were going too fast. That's not a good way to decelerate. You turned, you did a hockey stop. So you turned your body to decelerate because that's the best way to decelerate. Mm -hmm. So it's no different when we're jumping. Now, when we're jumping, when I say decelerate, that doesn't mean we're stopping. Mm -hmm. We don't want to kill momentum. We're transitioning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, transferring. Um, But that's still the most effective way to do it. So we step in and I'm going right, left, and I'm turning my body slightly to the right, not too much. I'm not Mm -hmm. doing like a full 90 degree turn, but maybe like half of that. Um, and then I'm taking off and that is the best way to be able to decelerate horizontally and transition vertically. Mm -hmm. Do you need to be able to jump from a square stance? Yes, because there is going to be times, right? If I'm driving left and you're on my hip, there's a lot of times where, and, and I started kind of on the right side of the hoop and I'm going towards the middle. There's times where the only angle I'm going to be able to get is me facing the basket. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to turn because that turn would be turning into you. Yeah. So there's a lot of situations where you do have to go off. But as far as like jumping as high as you can in open space, right? You're going to get a dunk. You're going to get a big rebound. You're going to get a block. Um, That's what you would want to get to is that turn stance. Mm. That's one area where you can make really quick improvements, add several inches just on improving that. And I do think it, it, it leads to better health because stopping anytime you're decelerating with your toes where you're going when you when your toes are pointing straight forward Mm -hmm. and you stop that's a lot of stress to the anterior compartment of the knees front of the knee patellar tendon gets a lot of stress Mm -hmm. um just like an outside foot stop in basketball like a hard decel with the toe pointing straight forward that is so that's no glute that is all quad dominant knee dominant when you get that turn now we get the hip structure involved I would rather be absorbing a lot more of that force through the hips instead of just through the knees. So I think from a longevity perspective, it also makes more sense to get to that turn stance. Definitely. Right? And then, I mean, just let's think about it logically. If I tell you to go as fast as you can and you don't hit that turn and you jump, you're not going to be able to get straight up. Mm-hmm. You're going to fade. You're going to jump forward. So you're going to have a combination of height and distance. That's not what we want. If we want max height, we don't want to get distance. Mm-hmm. Even even on the defensive side of the ball, when you think about rotating over from a defensive position, you just want to offer a good contest. If you don't have the ability to stop your forward momentum and transfer it vertically, exactly, you're gonna be, you're gonna be out of the game. You're exactly. Like, well, and, toppling and, over guys getting fouled. And most of the coaches would say, "Yeah, uh, well, we just got to chop our feet." Yeah, that's not the best way to decel. <laughs> yeah. That's not the best way to decel. Um, maybe we should talk about that on another podcast. Decelerate. Yeah. Of why chopping your feet may not be the best in every situation. <laughs> There's a few situations where it makes a little bit of sense, but overall yeah. that is not the best way to decelerate. Yeah, we should do an entire episode on just like the traditional coach's miss. That's a good one. That's Of, of like defensively, like turning your foot, mm-hmm. lead, point, and, and slide. Like there's a lot of good ones yeah. that, I could, that we that can do. That one's, oh gosh, that one's crazy important, the opening up your foot on the defensive yeah. slide. And that one's still, you could walk around 75% of the gyms in the country and see, All kid, the see little kids opening all the time um okay so where were we turn stance versus straight stance that's pretty simple i mean this one go watch vince carter go watch michael jordan like all these guys have perfect turn stances Mm -hmm. so you can really learn from watching these guys 
Uh, all right, let's move on to the one foot jump. So number one is stiffness. And so we talk about this all the time. Uh, when you're stepping into that one foot jump, we need the right amount of stiffness. Now, some people are power jumpers where even off one foot, they get a little bit deeper. So they might get a 90 degree knee angle. Um, most people, especially hoopers are not going to be those deep low jumpers. They're going to be more of a LeBron where the knee is almost stiff Yeah, and, and um, you're relying on the momentum from the run up, and that stiffness is the key. Um, now, this isn't necessarily a mechanics thing. It's one of those things where you improve the structure, which takes care of the mechanics. So improving your single leg jump stiffness, I've never been able to do it by saying like, hey, try to keep your knee stiffer. <laughs> it's like... Sounds like you, a dangerous cue. Yeah, no, it is. <laughs> it's, it's more so let's build that trait yeah. in the weight room and then let's see if we can gradually transition it into plyos. Mm -hmm. And then let's see if we can eventually get that into your single leg jumps. So yeah, that's, I put it under mechanics, but it's not necessarily a mechanical fix. It's a structural fix, which then takes care of the mechanics. Anyways, like, uh, have you ever had it where your, um, fast break, bringing in a bunch of speed yeah. and then your leg gives out, you go to go off one leg and your leg gives out. Mm -hmm. That was right when I, I mean, the first time that coming back from my meniscus injury, when I tried to rush it back in like freshman year of high school, I was coming off a fast break and that happened to me. And I thought, you know what I mean? I thought I destroyed my knee, but it was literally just that. I had yeah. coming off of an injury. I hadn't re, you know what I mean? Organized in ter terms of having that straight leg approach. Yeah. And what is that? I think there's a lot of factors. I think mm -hmm. one of the factors is the GTOs, um, gold, gold tendon organ. So basically it's your mom in a tendon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you, you know, telling you what to do. Yeah. <laughs> it's too dangerous bail. Yes. Yes. That's what the, I think of the GTOs as like an overprotective mom. Yeah. Um, but they're right. That's funny. That's yeah, the thing. Exactly. You're the kid. You're yeah. the little shithead kid. Yeah. It's like, I'm going to go do this. Exactly. And your mom's like, yeah, don't do that. Yeah. And she was right. Mm -hmm. And that's what the GTO is. It's like, you go to produce this high force and the GTO is like, yeah, don't do that. Yeah. We're going to, we're going <laughs> to seriously get hurt if you continue to do that. And so, it'll actually just relax the muscle. Mm -hmm. So it's like if you go to pick up the heaviest dumbbell and you don't tell yourself to stop, like you start to do it, your GTOs realize it's too heavy and it just relaxes the muscle. So like you give up, but you didn't make the conscious decision to give up. You're an idiot. You were yeah. going to keep trying to pull. <laughs> the GTO is the protective mom yeah. sitting there in the tendon. And um, so that's one of those things. Like, uh, you know, have you ever been double jumped where you're on a trampoline oh, gosh, yeah. and you're jumping with your friend and you're at that perfect timing where you're about to just take off? Mm -hmm. You could get 50 feet if you get that perfect, uh, that perfect timing, but you go to get it and it's so much force that your legs just buckle yeah. and you just fall. That's happened to everybody who jumps on a trampoline yeah, with their exactly. friends. That's how many, oh, that's what was happening. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's not like a lack of like concentric strength, concentric power. It's just it, you you weren't able to stay stiff and absorb all of that force. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that's the GTO. Like, yo, man, chill, come home. <laughs> yeah. Don't go out. Don't go out to the club. Come home. Yeah. Um, and so the good thing is that's trainable. So we get in the weight room. We've what we've talked about with like our heavy isometrics mm -hmm. that we use in the vert code. Um, plenty of stuff that we can do there um, to train that stiffness and, and start to get really good absorption. Um, any type of plyos, any any mm -hmm. stuff where it's like short ground contact plyos is typically pretty good here. So you're bounding type stuff. We do a lot of bounds overall in the vert code, a lot of different variations to the bound, ranging from submaximal bounds to all out maximal bounds. Um, skips, anything where you're producing high force with a very short range of motion, mm -hmm. where it's actually a little bit more ankle dominant. So it's like a little bit of knee flexion, a little bit of hip flexion, but most of the range of motion is happening at the ankles. Yeah, just popping. Whereas if you're like loading up for a counter movement jump, you're more like hip and, and knee, and you're dipping down low into those joint angles. Um, so like I give the cue, um, be more of a deer and less of a lion. <laughs> so look, I want to build lions. Yeah. I want to build that power, but there's also times where I want you to be a deer where you're running effortless and yeah, fluid. Like, yeah. And so a lot of times, like we get these guys who are lions, they can you, produce that yeah, force here and pound and just Yeah. Doof, doof. And they're these two foot jumpers. <laughs> but like when it comes to speed, mm. right? Like you're on a fast break and you got LeBron coming right behind you and I got to get up quick. Uh, yeah, we're going to want to be a deer <laughs> because we don't have the time to load up like a lion in those, these deep ranges of motion. Yeah. And the reason I say a lion, have you ever seen like a lion or a tiger jump? Yeah, you got that one video where you're throwing the so meat over sick. the fence. Yeah. <laughs> that was so feet, sick. Oh my gosh. 
Um, yeah, so that that stiffness, um, huge, man, huge. The more we can absorb, the more speed we can bring in, mm-hmm. the higher we can jump. That is the limiting factor for a lot of single leg jumpers. Um, okay. And then number two there is coordinating the arm swing. Mm-hmm. The arm swing is so awkward for a single leg jump. You think about it like, you know, off our two foot approach, we teach, if you don't have the ball, let's get a big counter movement arm swing. A lot of the best are getting their pinky, at least even with their ears. Mm-hmm. Some of them like kill Gannon yeah, exactly. and these guys, it's way up above their yeah. head. Um, but yeah, I mean, the arm swing is huge. It, it's, it's a significant part of your vertical jump, but like, uh, one foot, even if you don't have the ball and you're going to catch a lob, we can't afford to have that big of an arm swing mm-hmm. because it's too short of a ground contact time, right? The ground contact time is half on a single leg jump than it would be on a double leg jump. It depends on the individual, but it's probably going to be half. Um, and so we don't have the time to get that big counter move arm swing. So you go with these little, like, kind of like chicken wing things. Yeah. I, I've heard some people call it the chicken wing, um, where you're kind of just here with like this half arm swing, bent arm, get up. Um, but it's really, really tough. And then especially once we get the basketball, how do we still swing our arms? Mm-hmm. So you, Unless you really, Kawhi. yeah, well <laughs> you have, you have two options. Basically the, the two options that we teach in the vert code, uh, cross swing. Mm-hmm. So if I'm taking off with my left foot, as I'm stepping with that left, I'm bringing the ball to that left hip. Mm-hmm. So then that right leg is, is back behind me. And now I'm coming up rapidly, explosively with that right leg to drive. And I'm driving with the ball at the yeah. same time. For most people, this just comes natural. Mm-hmm. A lot of people though, it does not. <laughs> uh, so that is one way because we're not getting an arm swing from the back, but we're getting that momentum yes. from that cross rip other beautiful thing about this is the torso is highly Mm -hmm. involved so now it's not just your arms and it's not just your legs your torso is coiling and uncoiling and we can get a lot of kind of rotational power that adds to the overall jump um just picturing lebron on the fast break yeah lebron is the perfect one because you'll see they don't just do it with the ball they Mm -hmm. if i'm dipping the ball to that left hip my right shoulder goes with it a little bit yeah lebron just me yeah (laughs) boom and then it's just a hard rip zion these guys are incredible at doing this all right and then the other one is my go-to that's the one hand pickup yeah that's the ai style that's the Kyrie likes this lamello ball likes this lonzo ball likes this uh, Zach Levine likes yeah. this. Cam Reddish likes this. There's just a ton of guys that, mm. that get to this and they jump significantly higher when they get this. Jordan. Jordan's. Yeah, well, Jordan could also, he's different because he could palm it like yeah. crazy. So, <laughs> because what I'm talking about is like, there's a lot of guards that just do it. And it's floating. Yeah, yeah, like I can't palm it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and when I post about this, everybody's like, yeah, but they can all palm it. Yeah, exactly. No, they no. can't, dude. I yeah. can't palm it off the dribble. Mm-hmm. No chance, but I still do better with that. Yeah. All you got to do, there's a difference between palming the ball and gripping the ball. Yeah. I can't palm it, but I can get a good enough grip to balance it in my hand. Mm-hmm. Right? So I can get it here. And then I'm bringing it up. And a lot of times you reset in the air. So you'll bring that other hand because you don't have enough stability. So you go up with one, you bring the right to restabilize it. And then you'll kind of like cock back a little bit and you'll dunk. Yeah. Um, Depending on where your dunk package is. The reason that that is so beneficial is because look, if I put the ball in one hand, I now have a free arm. Mm -hmm. And so now I can go cross. Think about your sprinting mechanics. Exactly, when right yeah. knee goes up, left hand goes up. Mm-hmm. And now we get that. And that is a very natural way to just add a bunch of extra power and keep it nice and fluid. So I'm here, boom, big arm swing with that left hand. And then I'm up. And so now once I'm in the air, it's whatever. I could keep it in one hand if I got a good grip or I can touch and reset. Yeah. Uh, but like I jump significantly higher with that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a skill thing. It's like whatever you've repped the most, you're going to be better at. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of guys who will get two, three, four, five inches higher when they master that uh, that one arm. Yeah. Kyrie's definitely the guy I picture when I think yeah, about Kyrie it. Yeah, Kyrie loves that. And, and I like to study guys that aren't explosive who still get it done. Like, mm-hmm. they're not big jumpers. Like, LaMelo Ball is not a big jumper, and he's tall now, but back when he was like 6'4", six, 6'5", six, and he was first getting his dunks, yeah. he was not He's not a jumper, man. You could see, like, when you do enough <laughs> force plate tests, you can see force. Yeah. I don't need to test. I can see <laughs> yeah, how saying. you he's, apply he's force. Not, he's not producing anymore. <laughs> he's not producing any force, yeah, and he was still getting it done, like, still getting some decent dunks. Yeah. It's because he's kind of just, like, squirmy and wiggly with that, like, he yeah. had. He actually had really good single, arm, single leg jump, jump mechanics mm. with that one-hand pickup. 
Yeah, Lonzo, yeah. Lonzo's yeah, good, man. Yeah. And Lonzo does a low one-hand pickup. So a high one-hand mm-hmm. pickup's like an AI. I pick it up at my shoulder height. That's the one that I like. Uh, it's kind of like that old Statue of Liberty. Dump. Yeah, it's like Preppers, a Statue yeah. of Liberty. Uh, Lonzo, Zach Levine, mm-hmm. they would pound and then they'd pick up underhand from mm-hmm. the hip level. And then it's up. So they actually get a little bit more arm swing with that hand. Yeah, with the, My yeah. hands aren't big enough. It's It would be too high of a risk in a game for me to pick up low and swing with one hand. Yeah. Because I got tiny little hands. Mm. You ever seen the the, the Burger King commercial where he's got the big burger in the little hands? <laughs> yeah. That's me. That's funny. And so I don't want to put the ball in one hand because I'm that guy yeah. from the Burger King commercial. Off, the ball's going. <sighs> yeah. We don't want that. So I, I play it a little safer where I'm here. I'll pick it up with two and then I'll get it to one hand at the shoulder. Yeah. And then I got plenty of time to swing. Um, either way, I want you to mess with the cross Mm -hmm. and I want you to mess with the one hand pickup, figure out which one you're better at certain game situations will call for him because Hey, if you're just a one hand pickup guy and now you're in traffic, Mm -hmm. well, that one hand pickup's not very safe, right? If you're a cross swing guy and you have a guy right on your hip, that's not very safe. Yeah. Um, but coach, don't bring the ball down. This is another (laughs) area where people coach the instinct out of the player. So sometimes that's the right thing of like, Hey, don't cross it. If they keep getting stripped and they don't Mm -hmm. know how to use it, but the guys who are intuitive and play off field, they know when somebody is here. Mm -hmm. And so they're not going to get to that cross wing, but then they get in a situation where they got enough open space. Even if they got a guy behind them, they feel like they could still get to that cross wing. And now their coach told them, Hey, never do that cross wing. Now you're jumping four inches less because your coach coached the instinct out mm-hmm. of you. Um, so everything has a situation. A situation. Um, so yeah, that that's some ways. Like with that cross swing, we have a lot of different ways that we build it in the vert code. Uh, we do a lot of core stuff mm-hmm. that's kind of like opposite from low to high. Um, in phase 10, we have a basically a box drop where you have a dumbbell and we drop off mm. and then we punch. So as I'm landing, I'm dropping. My my right foot is on the box, and it's not a high box. I drop off, and I'm going to land on my left foot on the ground. As that left foot is hitting, I'm punching as hard as I can with that dumbbell across to the outside of my left knee. Yeah. So one, that's nice because I'm adding extra force to be absorbed on that leg by mm-hmm. punching downwards with weight, right? So now I got to absorb more force. But now to get out of that position and get back on the box, I have to have this cross rip. So now I got to rip that dumbbell back up. And what did I just get? I get that core yeah. coil and uncoil. And it's resisted because I have that dumbbell. Phase 10, kids. Yeah, phase, wait, wait, <laughs> wait to get there. And then once you get there, yeah, yeah you're going to like it. Yeah, no, yeah. You're going to yeah. like it. It's, it's just a, it's a very smooth exercise. And you start to feel like, oh, that's how yeah. I start to build in that that power. Um, and I've seen this. there. I used a lot of this, uh, the core stuff. I mean, think of like your low to high chop, mm-hmm. right? That's exactly. a, that's yeah, on the general level, but that's building those right muscles. Exactly. Um, and so I use a lot of that type of stuff for this reason in my first program mm-hmm. six, seven years ago. And, and then pretty recently, I've seen some articles where people are starting to come up with some good ideas, like different med ball tosses, yeah, cross exactly. med ball yeah. tosses. I saw somebody do an article. I don't know the guy's name, uh, but he was doing some cross med ball tosses. That makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Um to start to get the the core to actually do what it's supposed to do in that vertical so you can jump more like LeBron and less like a just a stiff guy relying on <laughs> pure muscle. Um okay, so yeah, those are the uh those are, those are the different styles and then obviously for our approach off two, the biggest problem is lacking the opposite of what you're comfortable with. Mm-hmm. So if you're right left, you yeah. suck at left right. Yeah. We want to balance those regular. two out. Yeah. Um, will you probably also have always have some sort of uh, imbalance? Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I want you to even it out as much as you can. The more you become even, the more lethal we are in games. Because remember, I want you to master that go to because yeah, I understand you want to throw down windmill dunks, but I don't want you to be a warm up dunker. Mm-hmm. I want you to be an in game reactionary. You can dunk, you can get up in certain situations yeah. to extend off the glass. Like I want your vertical to improve your game. That's the goal exactly. for me, Yeah. right? Like if you want to be a, a, a professional dunker, that's an entirely different goal, mm-hmm. right? And that's cool. Vertco can help you with both, but we're more so on that side of we're going to build balance and we're going to also work on those weaknesses uh, because if, if it's about basketball, it's about balance. Um, and then the same for that one foot, like this is – 
the imbalance is even more drastic here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. If you're right-handed, you're going to be jumping off that left <laughs> foot yeah. all, like 90% of the time, unless you're a John Wall. But mm -hmm. um, there's a few cases. But yeah, I mean, going off that right leg. And like we've talked about before, like you're not going to clear that up in the weight room because you're going to clear that up by working on the skill of jumping. Mm -hmm. Because again, like me and most athletes, we jump off our left, but our right leg is stronger weight room wise. Exactly. A standing vertical jump, my right leg is it's more because that's more, more strength and power. Mm -hmm. Running, it's about skill. It's about <laughs> what did you build? What, what kind of childhood reps did you get? Mm -hmm. And I got more with my left leg. And so that's always going to be ahead. But like when it comes to balancing it, People just go, oh yeah, you just got to get strong on both legs. Nope, that's not it. <laughs> that's not it. You got to go get real life reps. Yeah. And so, man, we do it very, uh, we do, so like 20 minute dunk sessions. We'll progress, we'll go 10 minute dunk sessions and then later we'll go 20 minute dunk sessions. And so basically for a certain amount of time, like the first 10 minutes, I want you to go off your go-tos. So it's left leg and it's a right left plant or whatever mm. you like. The last 10 minutes, it's all weakness. And I want you to freestyle and have fun with it, but you have to do all the stuff that you suck at. That's perfect. So you're going and you're trying to dunk. You're trying to dunk off your right foot. You're trying to dunk left, right, whatever it is. You're trying to dunk with your, you're trying to jump off your right and dunk with your right and just like do different stuff that you hate to do and you would never naturally do on your own. Mm -hmm. Um, but you start to really balance out and then you notice little things like your finishing options all of a sudden go through yes. the roof because you're so used to going, being good off that left leg but now you go off that right leg and now we can finish with either hand because we actually have some general coordination in the air. Mm. Like there's so many areas that it improves when you get better off both. Oh yeah, exactly. That That's arguably the most important factor is that yeah. the amount that you're going to increase your game just by having the ability to control yourself going off that opposite foot. Right, right. Definitely. All right, guys, thanks for watching episode eight. I really enjoyed this one. If you're willing to apply this stuff and stay patient with your jump mechanics, Trust me, you can make a huge transformation. Mechanics is half the battle. It's boring. It's tough to get through, but it's so important for your long-term development in your vertical jump. Hey, be sure to check out pjfperformance.net. Um, Off-season is all about the gains. And hey, even in season, we got guys making gains. We got guys making tr crazy uh, transformation in their vertical jump, their explosiveness, their balance, their core strength. We basically every serious athletic trait that you got to master, uh, we include in the programs. So let's get after it. What are you waiting for?